Good morning, guys. We're going to continue today with a choc the Chocolate Touch. Um, just as a quick review, last week we were doing Chapter 7. Um, and the questions that I asked you to answer were a lot of review questions. And you guys did a great job. I went over all of them and they looked really good. Um, I just want to review specifically that last question is the only one that appeared in Chapter 7. So I want to review that quickly. Um, so in chapter seven, John was at lunch in the cafeteria. He was all excited. He thought, you know, maybe I'm going to be able to eat my lunch and not have it turn into chocolate. He was really thirsty. He wanted to just enjoy some regular food, right? And he tried to have vegetables and things on his tray that, you know, were good for him, um, because that's what sounded good to eat. Um, and he thought that if he could avoid touching his lips with his food, that he would be able to have things stay regular food and not chocolate, right? So he was cutting his food up really small and he was trying to open his mouth really wide and get the food in without touching his lips and everything still turned to chocolate. He tried to tip his head all the way back and just dump food into his mouth, right? And if he could open his mouth real big and not touch his lips, but what happened instead, not only did the food turn to chocolate, but when he tried to take a drink out of the glass, the glass turned to chocolate. When he tried to take a bite off a fork, the fork turned to chocolate, right? So it's getting worse. That chocolate is spreading now, right? So if he touches something like this, everything then turns to chocolate. Okay, so we'll continue now with chapter eight of the Chocolate Touch, which is the end of John's school day and what happens. Okay, so here we are with chapter eight. English class passed without incident. Miss Plimsoll dis distributed word lists for her pupils to take home. The more words you know, she explained as always, the more exactly you can think. There were some difficult new words, John noticed. Indigestion, acidity, unhealthiness, moderation, digestibility. As Miss Plimsoll explained the meaning of each one, it seemed to John as though they all had a special bearing on his present uncomfortable condition. At last the bell rang. Very well, class, Miss Plimsoll said. Time for outside activities. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Miss Plimsoll. Miss Plimsoll gave the signal for dismissal, and the pupils in the front row filed out, followed by those in the second row, including John and Susan. Susan played a violin in the school orchestra, and usually she and John went to the rehearsals in the auditorium together. This time Susan hurried on ahead of him. John followed very slowly. The members of the orchestra were sitting at their music stands on the auditorium stage when John, carrying his dark blue trumpet case, got to his chair in the brass section. Mrs. Quaver had already begun to explain a difficult passage to the girl who played the flute. Just after John sings, nestling chirp and flee, she was saying, you come in with your trill. Doodle -oo -doo -oo -doo -doo -doo. Do you see the place on your score? Good. Ah, John, Mrs. Quaver explained, seeing him in his place. I'm glad you're not absent. As I've just told the others, this afternoon we're having the first joint rehearsal of my arrangement of A Boy's Song by James Hogg. We've been over all the individual parts and all the sections, you will recall. Now it's time to fit the pieces together. John nervously opened his trumpet case and took his shining golden trumpet from its bed of scarlet velvet. The beautiful new instrument gave him cons confidence. He worked the valves nimbly with his fingers and looked up at Mrs. Quaver again. Now, John, she said, tell me when your little solo begins. Right after the end of the second verse, John promptly replied. He had practiced his part every evening in the basement at home for the last two weeks. He knew every note perfectly. After the line, that's the way for Billy and me. Good, Miss Quaver said, and don't forget what I told you, John. This is a happy song. I want you to play ta-ta, ta-ta. Ta 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 oh. simply repeating the rhythm of the voice and i want you to be light and lively this is supposed to be the song of a boy who loves romping in the country ta 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 ah oh. john thought that shouldn't be too difficult even with a whole orchestra listening to him he had played it over and over again at home but he would have to try extra hard here this was to be his first solo Everyone else was depending on him to play it properly. Right, Mrs. Quaver, said Mrs. Quaver brightly with her baton. She rapped twice sharply on the music stand before her. All the musicians brought their instruments into playing position. Susan poised her bow over the strings of her violin. John held his trumpet close to his mouth and wiggled his fingers on the valves. 
Mrs. Quaver's baton moved from side to side, up and then down. The cymbals clashed and the drums thumped. The pianist brought his fingers down on the ivory keys of the piano. The violinists and cellists made their swinging and whumping sounds. All were in perfect unison. The rehearsal had begun. After the introduction, one of the older boys began to sing. Where the pools are bright and deep, where the gray trout lies asleep, up the river and over the lee, that's the way for Billy and me. After the last line of the first verse, John's fellow trumpeter echoed the rhythm of the singer's voice. Ta-ta, ta-ta, ta-ta-ta, ta-ta-ta. Miss Quaver smiled approvingly at the successful performance, and with her baton gave the singer the signal to begin the second verse. Where the blackbird sings the latest, an oboe went peep. Where the hawthorn blooms and the sweetest, where the nestlings chirp and flee, the flute warbled according to plan. That's the way for Billy and me. John swallowed with an effort to put the mouthpiece of his trumpet to his lips for his solo. The mouthpiece instantly changed to chocolate. Then almost as fast, the chocolate spread along the instrument, changing all the flashing gold into dull brown. The first name note came out fairly true. Ta! But chocolate trumpets cannot withstand much pressure. The hole in the mouthpiece softened and clogged up, and the valve stuck as John desperately tried to finish his part. Mrs. Quaver's eyes almost popped out of her head as she listened to him play. Ta, ta, tu, ta, ter, ta, 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 ta. It sounded as though John were trying to play a soap-filled bubble pipe. Terribly flustered, he put down his trumpet. Miss Quaver was speechless. The orchestra was rocked by uproarious laughter. The other trumpeter leaned over toward John's chair and picked up the trumpet. It's a chocolate trumpet, he shouted derisively. No wonder it sounded like that. John Midas was trying to play a chocolate. John didn't wait to hear any more. He fled from the stage and out to the playground. Without stopping even to look around, he ran through the stone gateway and homeward. And here's John, all embarrassed because he wasn't able to play a solo and running out. Okay, so that's the end of chapter eight. There's a couple questions for you to answer. If you need any help, make sure you reach out. Thanks, guys. See you soon.